Take your Bibles, if you will, please, and turn to Mark, the book of Mark. Thank you, Jake, for setting this up for me. I appreciate it. All right. Mark chapter 7, and uh, we're going to get to that in a minute. Now, um, Daniel's out of town, or uh, actually, I think he just got back. Didn't he? Just, he was, uh, he was, yeah, he was uh, on a missions trip. Um, no, he, he was uh, out of town. So, um, anyways, thank you, Pastor, for giving me an opportunity. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, the other day, uh, I, was, uh, I was at the hospital, and there was, Pastor knows this happens from time to time, chapter 7. Betty, chapter 7. Okay. All right. So, uh, from time to time, uh, you'll see an opportunity to talk to, talk to somebody. And we were, I was at Baptist Hospital. You know how around the rooms there's like a, a, a green space there, and there are benches around the outside. And I, I stopped and sat down next to somebody. And they were, uh, one of the individuals was very upset, and so we talked for a little bit. And the other person said to me, that a gentleman said, so what kind of preacher are you? And I would, you know, I don't know that I've been asked that question before. What kind, how would you respond to that? Saved. Huh? Saved? Oh, saved? Okay. All right. And well, my, my answer was, I'm a gospel preacher. Okay. I thought about saying a Baptist preacher, um, but boy, Lord, help us if, <laughs> if a Baptist preacher is not a gospel preacher, right? Um, and uh, as I spent time thinking about it, um, I think there is, a, there is a difference there. There is a difference. There are a lot of people that, that preach, uh, or, but it's, if you're not preaching the gospel, you're not really preaching, because preaching is talking about heralding the good news. That's what preaching is all about. So uh, if you don't share the gospel, you might be teaching, you might be uh, bloviating, you might be, uh, you might be uh, communicating, but you're not a gospel preacher. Uh, a gospel message is something that includes or is discussed. Uh, the, the topic comes up about the, the fact that Jesus was virgin born and lived a sinless life. He was crucified on a, on a cross of, in, on Calvary. Uh, his body was placed into a tomb, and he was resurrected on the third day. Uh, he was, spent some time with his disciples, and then he gave them, them the great commission before he was ascended into heaven. That's the gospel. Spurgeon put it this way when he was uh, stressing how important it is that Jesus be the central theme of our messages, uh, preaching messages. He said to a young man, young man, from every town and every village and every hamlet in England, wherever it may be, there is a road that leads to London. So from every text in Scripture, there is a road toward the great metropolis of Christ. That is a fantastic statement. And I have tried to say that so many times, and I don't ever nail it. You know, if you ever watched um, Home Improvement, you ever watched Home Improvement? You know what? Okay. Okay, you know, um, there's a guy on the other side of the fence. You all only know him by this much right here. His name's Wilson, right? Right? And Wilson's very wise. He says these very wise things, right? And... Uh, Tim, the tool guy, always hears Wilson say these wise things, and then he goes back and tries to repeat them to his wife and always messes them up. I'm Tim, the tool guy, okay? I always mess them up. But what a powerful statement this is here. And the truth is that every message that we preach, especially when we're preaching from the, the New Testament, every message should take us back to the cross. And so we will get there eventually, I promise you that. But I want to talk to you about a, a, a message that I think, a, a passage, really, that I think sometimes is skipped over because of a, uh, maybe a controversial, it's not really controversial, it's just a difficult portion of this passage. Um, and we're, we're, I'm calling it uh, Passion and Compassion. 
today. So, okay? Mark chapter 7, verse 24. Okay? Listen, we're on Dave time today, so we should be done by quarter after. Okay? And from thence he arose and went unto the borders of Tyre and Sidon and entered into a house and would have no man know it, but he could not be hid. Let's just... Just real quick, kind of explain what's going on here. Jesus was in Galilee. A great ministry is happening there. Jesus is healing people. He's preaching. He's teaching. He's doing all this stuff. It's just a great and exciting time there with Jesus. And then just almost on a whim, Jesus decides to uh, leave Galilee and to go to Tyre and Sidon. Now, if you ever look at a A map of Galilee, you might see Tyre and Sidon. It's usually at the top, on a map of Galilee, it's at the very top left-hand corner of that map. It's a port city, and it is not part of Galilee at all, but it gives you an idea how far it is. Now, depending on where Jesus was exactly at that time, in the region of Galilee would determine how long of a trip that was. So we really don't know. They, they say it was somewhere between 20 and 30 miles. Uh, Jesus left what he was doing in Galilee. He's ministering to people there, having great success, obviously, right? It's the Lord Jesus, right? And so he travels 20 to 30 miles to, to Tyre and Sidon. And there at Tyre and Sidon, as far as we know, as far as we know, he has a conversation with one person. Why did he go to Tyre and Sidon? As far as we know, there was one reason, to meet this woman, okay? So uh, we, we see the, the, the connection here, okay? Uh, and so it, it goes on and says, oh, I, I need to cover this real quick, okay? So it says that he, let me read it exactly. It says he would have no man know it but he could not be hid. In other words, when he went there, he went there with uh, hoping that he could kind of sneak into town real fast, all right? Now, I don't think he was going so far to put the little plastic glasses on with the fake eyebrows or anything like that. I don't think that was happening, okay? But I think that Jesus had some place that he was going to go and stay and was kind of hoping that he would be able to kind of slide into town, take care of business, and then slide back out of town, Okay? But the Bible says that he could not do that. In other words, the fame of Jesus had spread so widely that he could not go to Tyre and Sidon because it was found out there in Tyre and Sidon that Jesus was there. Okay? So it's important for us to understand why that happened, okay? Do you remember Jesus healed a leper? And before he left town, he said, listen, don't tell Anybody? Do you remember that? And guess what he did? He told everybody, right? Now, it's a shame that Jesus saves us and tells us to tell everybody, and we tell nobody. But in this particular case, he went and he told everybody. And it was because of this leper and the testimony of this leper that all of a sudden the word began to spread. And you can only imagine, if you were a leper and you heard about your leper friend who got healed of leprosy, you would say, hey, how, you know, how this happened to you? I got, hey, this man named Jesus reached down and he touched me. Or he, Jesus spat on the ground, got some mud, or whatever the, the case, if he was blind man, whatever. And all of a sudden, every leper, every blind man, every, everybody that had any ailment at all, every person that had a prayer request, right, would be seeking out an opportunity to find Jesus. And so this, his ministry during this time really blew up, if you will. Uh, you know, a similar thing happened to, uh, to Billy Graham. My wife and I uh, went to visit uh, Luke in North Carolina, and there is a, uh, the library of Billy Graham. If you have never gone, I would encourage you to go. Have you ever been, Pastor? Oh, you would thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, some, some great, great uh, stuff there, Okay. And there, um, there at that museum, there was a story that was told about Billy Graham that in the 40s, he was just kind of a small-time evangelist who would go around and preach and so on. But then as popularity began to grow and he had this desire to have a citywide campaign in L.A. So the L.A. Crusades were started. 
And Billy Graham was having some good crowds, and he was having a, a lot of people saved, but it really just wasn't quite taking off yet until there was this man named Stuart Hamlin. Stuart Hamlin was a, uh, a radio personality. This is before TV and movies and stuff like that. He was kind of a radio personality, and he was uh, very popular. He was also known for having kind of a, a wicked lifestyle. Well, he went to one of Billy Graham's uh, uh, crusades, and he got saved. If you will, bear with me here. He, he really got saved. You know what I mean? I mean, his life was totally changed. As a matter of fact, he wrote a song. He wrote a song that used to be sung all the time. Uh, it, is, uh, it is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. With arms wide open, he'll pardon you. Thank you, I got my doo wops over here. Uh, it is no secret what God can do. So, how many of you have heard that song? You've ever heard that song before? Okay. All right. All right. Mike, did you raise your hand? I said, how many young people have heard that song? Hey, you, you read? <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so his life was totally transformed. So um, uh, just some amazing things. And actually, it was through Hamlin's testimony that the crusades really began to take off. I'm talking about uh, criminals. I'm talking about uh, people of ill repute were going to the revival meetings and getting saved. Uh, bar keepers were going and getting saved, and then they would shut down their bar. I mean, we're talking about like revival type stuff that was going on. And so this revival meeting worked its way up the coast, and the, there was a crowd that began to follow him. Soon after all of that, he went up to Oregon, and while he was in Oregon, there was a man named William Randolph Hearst. Is any, does that ring a bell to anybody? Okay, um, if maybe not him, but his granddaughter, I believe it was, okay? He had several newspapers, and so he sent word out. He sent out word, two words that were sent, telegraphed. Two words were pump Graham. That's all he said, pump Graham. And what that meant was tell everybody about what Billy Graham is doing. And soon, in every newspaper in the land, above the fold, if you will, there was a story about Billy Graham. Billy Graham was taking a long trip to Boston. By the time he got to Boston, there at the train station, 15,000 people were there to meet him. So he went from a small-town little evangelist, now he's preaching citywide campaigns, and a group of 15,000 people there to meet him. Similar situation happened with the Lord Jesus, but far more powerful, wouldn't you say? And I mean, there's this crowd of people that are, that are following after Jesus. So let's look at verse number 25. For a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him. Now, isn't that interesting to you? Listen now, look, look, look up this way for a second. There is this woman who heard about Jesus. Now, remember where they're at. They're in a wicked city, Tyre and Sidon. She's in a wicked Gentile area. She herself is a Canaanite. The Canaanites were enemies of God's people. They were the ones that when Joshua went into the land, they had to kick out the Canaanites. Are you with me? So, if you will, and especially in that day, it was also an awkward thing and something that was not suggested for a man to have a conversation with a woman by himself. But nevertheless, Jesus goes and he travels this great distance. He meets up with this woman, finds out that this woman, not, not only is she a Canaanite, a Gentile, she is not a, a Jew at all. He's having this conversation. She heard about Jesus and then we find out one other detail that her daughter 
is demon possessed. Now that's a tough case right there. That's a tough case, all right? If I, if I called you up and said, hey, um, I need you to help me out in your D group. And I, I have this, this person, if you don't mind, let me just give you a little, some details. They, we need to place them in a D group. Okay, great. Brother Dave, who, who do you have? Well, she is, let me explain. She is, she's not, you know, from around here, okay? Um, she's uh, kind of a, got a wicked uh, past. Um, she's a, a Canaanite. Um, and uh, her daughter is demon-possessed. Uh, she'll be over next Tuesday, okay? Do you see what I'm saying? Do you, think, do you think that there might be a little bit of anxiety there? Oh, my goodness, what, you know, what is going to happen here? But you know what? When you have those type of cases like that, and Jesus points this out and proves this to be true, there is great victory that comes in those situations. So Jesus tr- makes this long trek, if you will, up the coast to Tyre and Sidon, and, and uh, meets this uh, Syrophoenician woman who has a demon-possessed daughter. Now, whenever you talk about a, a devil in somebody or a demon, usually the, it gets a little bit tense in the room, okay? And because there, there are people outside this room, I don't, don't think we have that, this issue here, but people outside this room that if they hear you talking like that, they think you're crazy, do you, do you really believe that, there's, that there are devils, that there are demons? Do you really believe it? Personally, yes, I do. And the reason I believe it is because Jesus believed it. So you just mark me down. Wherever Jesus says he believes, I'm going to believe that too. And Jesus is the one who's talking about this particular situation and this woman who had a demon-possessed child. Verse number 27, But Jesus said unto her, Let, that, let the children... First be filled. Let me, let me back up. I need to back up to verse 26. I missed that, okay? The woman was a Greek and Syrophoenician by nation, and she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. So, do you get the picture here? Lord, I've got this. My daughter is in a mess. She is possessed by the devil. Lord, would you please take care of this situation? I... I believe that you can because I heard about you and I heard what you've done. Now, just a real quick pause here, okay? Aren't you thankful for the one person that gave a testimony about Jesus that made this Syrophoenician woman hear about Jesus so that she can go and seek Jesus out? Aren't you? I'll tell you one person who's really glad about that, the daughter of the Syrophoenician lady. Don't you think? Boy, I I would imagine she would say, who was it, Mom? Mom, tell me, who was it that told you about Jesus? She might have said, I don't even know that person's name, but I heard him talking in the marketplace. I I, I saw him in the marketplace, and they they told me about Jesus. Where do they live? I I don't even know where they live. Just somebody told me about Jesus. Listen, there are people out there right now that need to hear about Jesus. And it is our opportunity and our privilege to tell them about Jesus. We're fixing to come up to our um, friend and family day, okay? And we're asking everybody, you know, we, we, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be hitting it pretty hard. We ask everybody to be prayer, uh, prayerful about who you might invite to come to church, Now, I wonder, even right now, how many of you right now can think of somebody, let let me put it this way. There's somebody that you're thinking of that you would not want to go to heaven without them. Are you following me? Can you think of somebody, a friend, a coworker, and you know that they're not saved, and you, you're thinking in your heart, boy, I just, it, when I go to heaven, I, I want them to be there. How many of you are thinking of someone right now? Raise your hand, okay? All right? Okay? Every person in this room that raised their hand ought to be focusing on that person to get them into church on October 1st. 
That's our friends and family day. It is the first, isn't it, guys? I think it is, okay? Uh, sure hope that's the day and they don't show up and nobody's here. But um, So uh, thank God for that person who gave a testimony. And you, you have no idea what your testimony, where your testimony goes. We don't know how many times it bounces off a wall before it finally gets to somebody into that heart of that person that is desiring to learn something about Jesus. So praise God for And you know what? There's nothing wrong with knocking on a door from time to time and handing out a, an invitation. There's nothing wrong with going up to a coworker and saying, hey, listen, man, I'm not here to preach at you right now, but let me just tell you something. I would love for you to read this right here. If you have any questions, would you come talk with me about it? You know, there's all kinds of ways that you could witness to people, but we live all surrounding us are people that are desirous to hear about the testimony of Jesus Christ. And we have no idea how it will impact a whole generation by one testimony. So let me challenge you to do that. Now to verse 27. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it unto the dogs. Boy, that sounds harsh. Okay, do you remember I, when we began talking about this, I said that there is something about this passage here that sometimes causes us to miss out on some great truths in this passage simply because of something difficult. That's that difficult thing. We get so fixated on, I can't believe Jesus said, called this woman a dog. I mean, but, well, there, there is, I think, some help in that area. And that is, the word that is used there for dog is a word that is used for like a family pet. So it wasn't so much that Jesus was saying, you know, get out of the way, you dog. And that's not what Jesus was saying. He was saying, I came for my family. I came primarily for the Jews. And I'm here to help the Jews. And this woman said, and Jesus said, it's not right for me to come for the purpose of the Jews and yet to feed it to a household pet. How many of you have a household pet? Okay, raise your hand, okay? Are you serious? One, two, three, four, five? The rest of you don't have pets? Okay. Uh, how many are dog people? Are you dog people? How many are cat people? Okay, you may want to leave. You may want to leave, okay, in a second, okay? Are you a cat person? I could have guessed that. Yeah, I've seen her come into church. You know, looking at her seat. So, um, do you know that Americans love their pets? They love their pets. Listen to this. In 2022, Americans, Americans only, spent $136.8 billion on pets. Do you know that there are insurance plans for pets? Did you know that? Did you know that? Uh, did you know that there are dental plans for pets? Okay. Did you know that there are optometrists? No, there's not. I just made that one up. But, you know, there is so much money that's spent on, on pets. Um, people spend hundreds, even thousands of dollars to bury their pets, okay? Uh, now, I'm going to tell you a story, and I, this story is absolutely true. I can verify this, but there was a time that I worked for Peebles, and one of the things that I had to do from time to time when they didn't have anybody else, would they would send me to go pick up pets that have died that need to be, either be cremated or whatever. Now, I can't believe I'm telling this story, okay? But I want to tell you, I verified, I, I cleared this with my wife, and she said I would be okay, all right? So I went to this one house, and I picked up this pet. And so uh, when I got there, I asked the lady um, what the dog's name was and so on. And they want you to act with compassion, and, and we do. I mean, the, the, the folks at Peebles really do a great job, both, on both sides, the human side and the pet side. 
they do a great job. They're very compassionate people. And I will tell you this, that they are very honest people as far as how they deal with your loved one if, if you ever have your, your loved one in their care. But I'm on the pet side now. And they want, you, they want us to be very careful about that. So they kind of scripted it for us, okay? So there's several things that we have to say after we pick up this pet. So I have this little script of things that I'm supposed to say to them. And I said, now, uh, what, uh, what was your pet's name? And this lady said to me, our pet's name is Poop. And I, I said, can you, can you spell that, please? Yes, P-O-O-P. And she said, it's kind of a funny story, but right now I'm just so, so heartbroken. I'm like, okay, all right, I'm trying to control myself. And she said, and so I'm, now I'm looking at my script and said, so I'm supposed to say this, okay, ma'am, um, we, um, we just picked up um, poop and, and, and put them in our, our vehicle, and we're going we're gonna to take... poop back to our, our care center. And when we have cremated, when we have cremated um, poop, we're going to call you, and you can come to our office Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, and, 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 and pick, pick up poop. Uh, so um, it was alarm. It was very difficult to do, but this lady is very kind and very sweet, and she went through it very well, Okay. People spend thousands of dollars on their pets. How many of you, uh, do you let your pet lick you in the face? Okay, don't, don't raise your hand. Okay, don't raise your hand, okay? Um, but we spend all kinds of money on pets. And this is the type of terminology, if you will, that Jesus is, is using here. He's using endearing language here. Difficult for us to understand. Of course, we're in a different age, Right? But in that age, it was, a, it was understandable what Jesus was saying here. And what happens is when we look at this, the, the terminology that's used here and how difficult it is for us to understand that, that sometimes we just totally miss out on what is taking place here. And what is taking place here is that Jesus loves, watch now, Jesus loves this woman so much that he would go 40 to 60 miles out of his way just to have one encounter with this one woman to heal her daughter. And that's something that's lost in that story. Jesus loves you with all the passion in the world. So here are the points, and we'll, I'll be done quickly, okay? Number one is this. Someone told her about Jesus. We already covered that. Somebody told her about Jesus. Can you be one to tell somebody about Jesus? Number two is this. She was passionate about her request. So it was, if, if she lived in our day, she would be a Facebook stalker. You follow me? How did she know where Jesus was living? I mean, Jesus was in Galilee. How did she know that Jesus was going to arrive on this day? How did she know where the house that Jesus would be staying? How did she know all this information? We don't know, but she stalked Jesus out and she found Jesus. She was, a pas she was passionate in her request. And then when she asked Jesus about it, notice what happened. She was also persistent when Jesus kind of gave her a halfway no, she came up with a great answer. Do you remember what the answer was? She said, he said, it's not right for me to, to hand out crumbs to, uh, to, uh, to a, a little puppy dog. And she said, but yes, Lord, but even a little puppy dog sits at the foot of a child and will sit there and wait for the crumbs. Do you see the respect? Even though it's a difficult task, do you, see the res do you see the comeback? Do you see the pushback? Do you understand she's pushing back against the Messiah? She is, she is kind of, if you will, arguing with 
God about, Lord, please, this is so important. Spurgeon said about this particular situation that Jesus handled this woman the way a jeweler would handle a a precious diamond, turning it in the light to see its facets and beauty to know just exactly where to cut that diamond. That's what Jesus was doing in this moment. It was nothing that was offensive. It was nothing that was harmful to this woman. This woman was steadfaster in her, her request, and she asked for Jesus to please hear her prayer. She was persistent. But not only that, there's some secondary lessons here. Number four is this, Jesus loves all people. She's a Canaanite. We already talked about that. She is she's living in a, a wicked place. She's got a demon-possessed daughter. Boy, if we heard about a situation like this, we'd say, well, hold on a second. We, uh, we have our church setting here, and to invite somebody into our church that would be demon-possessed, we might have some people that will be a little upset that that demon-possessed person sitting in their section. Jesus was compassionate. And let me tell you something. If you come to Jesus with great passion, seeking to have your loved one saved, Jesus will meet your passion with great compassion. We have got to be busy about sharing the truth of the gospel with our loved ones. Do you have a granddaughter or a grandson that is not saved? You better get on it. You better get on it. Do you have a family member that's not saved? You better be a witness. You better give a testimony. Do you know somebody, a coworker that's not saved? What would happen if you heard about your coworker who, who perhaps just passed? Do you know the first thing that you're going to think about? You're going to think about, I never took time out to witness to my coworker. Can I tell you this? The statistics are against us. Ten out of every ten of us will die. You better share your testimony with someone that you love and that you care about. So Jesus loves all people. Number five is this. Come, uh, uh, come to Jesus with your passion, and he will meet you with deeper compassion. And the last point is this. Be patient. Be patient. Now, remember, this woman... The whole time Jesus was in Galilee, her daughter was demon-possessed. What caused Jesus to drop what he's doing and travel to Tyre and Sidon? I don't know. But it took some time for Jesus to get up there. It took time for her to find Jesus. And when she talks to Jesus, Jesus says, finally, the, the final answer is this. Jesus says, you have given a good answer. Your daughter has been healed. Go home to your daughter. She's lying in bed, healed. She could not walk fast enough. She ran home, I would imagine. I would imagine she could not get home soon enough to see what God had done. Verse 29, And he said unto her, For this saying, Go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. And when she was come to her house, She found the devil gone out and her daughter laid upon the bed. What a great story. You know, we we ought to read these stories and rejoice in the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How Jesus saves us, redeems us, and changes us. Let's stand. I'm going to ask that we use this time to pray for those people. This, this, is, this is not a time, come on up, guys, okay. This is not a time for you to zip up your Bible and count down the moments until it's time for you to leave. This is a time that you need to be thinking about somebody that you need to witness to, somebody that you need to invite to church. And then would you come forward and pray for that individual? Pray and speak that person's name in prayer. 
And let this be the beginning of something wonderful. May this be the beginning of a trip to Tyre and Sidon. May this be the beginning of someone handing out a testimony that makes an influence. May this be the beginning of seeing a changed life in your grandkids or your kids or a coworker or a friend or a relative. Right now, would you bow your head and close your eyes and would you pray for that person that you're thinking of right now? Would you pray for that person? Can I give you some good news? God already knows who that person is. If Jesus could leave Galilee and travel all the way to Tyre and Sidon, knowing exactly who he's going to talk to when he gets there, I would imagine Jesus knows the name of the person you're thinking of. Would you come and agree with him? Do you know that's what repentance is? It's when we agree with God about our sin, and let's come and agree with God about the person that you need to witness to.